Welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Betty Chen. China recently saw crucial political changes, including the death of ex-premier Li Keqiang and the dismissal of key officials like former Defense Minister Li Shangfu and Foreign Minister Qin Gang. How do these developments impact China's relations with the U.S. and Taiwan? And how should we analyze the changes in Xi Jinping's authority? Joining us today are Cai Rongxiang, National Zhongzhen University Professor of Political Science, and Huang Kuibo, National Zhengzhou University Professor of Diplomacy. A warm welcome to both of you on the show. So let us start today's conversation. How do you approach China's high-level turbulence and Xi Jinping's use of power? Do you think that China is currently adopting a more centralized leadership approach? Professor yeah, Cai. That, that's true because uh, it's a very, very personalized approach to power and she calls uh, all the shots uh, by himself and he wants to be the leader of the party because uh, it's kind of like a Chinese style of politics because this is we call hegemonic leadership uh, model because the only one group can be dominate in all politics and sometimes you have to defeat the other faction so she tried to uh, centralize his power in his hand. So that's for sure. This is what we call uh, authoritarian uh, regime, or, or maybe you can say it's a totalitarian regime model. So I think, but the problem of this kind of approach is that because uh, you are surrounded, the leader is surrounded by uh, some yes men, right? So they, no one would dare tell him any mistakes or policy failures. So that's the problem uh, we have to sort of to, to observe uh, what's going on uh, in the near future. Professor Huang, what's your take on this? Uh, I think Xi Jinping made a very instant uh, and decisive decision in order to cut the damage that could have been caused by these two high-level officials. We have had little information about why these two officials were sacked. However, I, I think there must be a reason. Either money or women or in a proper France, or they offended Xi Jinping's highest authority. We have no idea which one, but I think uh, all these incidents indicate that Xi Jinping still has a very solid grasp of his ruling in mainland China. So it will become even more centralized mm. in the future? I think it's been centralized for years. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if it's so centralized or not. But you know, it, it's, it is a centralized system. But I think Xi Jinping's you know, garnering power and control of power have been proved uh, uh, remain as solid as it is before. So now Xi Jinping is entering into his historic third term. And in the initial year, significant leadership changes have spurred speculation about his rule. So what kind of global and domestic challenges is Xi confronting now? And do you think that these challenges are linked to, say, the competition with the United States or the tensions across the Taiwan Strait? OK, let me say a few things about domestic stuff. Uh, the driver of Chinese economy are getting stuck. And China is facing a uh, serious economic downturn, uh, such as soaring growth, uh, soaring national debt, uh, capital fry, uh, skyrocketing use um, employment rate, and high mortgage failure rate, and a shrinking population, uh, just to name a few. So it's very difficult for China to handle these problems, uh, or maybe headwinds on multiple fronts, because uh, the Chinese model is significantly broken now. So, uh, and also, China is in the middle, uh, in the trap of middle income problem. So I think this is a big, uh, a big uh, obstacle for China, uh, especially in economy. You have to balance uh, between demand and supply. So I think it's a very, very uh, serious situation now. So Professor Tsai, you talk about the domestic issues faced by Xi. What do you think about the, may say, international challenges yeah. faced by Xi? Uh, before I jump in on the international issues, I would like to go back a little bit sure. to the domestic. Uh, I think you know, economic slowdown is, of course, a big you know, damage to Xi Jinping's ruling in mainland China. And also the unemployment rate, especially among the youth, the young people, you know, also caused some concern among these uh, mainland Chinese people. And 
the, the decline of the real estate prices and the markets, you know, again, constitute another threat to the stability of mainland China's economy. And also, if we can look at the so-called international or cross-strait level, you know, again, you know, the Republic of China is going to have its presidential election in this com upcoming January 6th or 13th, 13th. 13th. Okay. Yep. So, you know, who is going to win the election? And that person, how is he going to deal with the mainland Chinese authorities, you know, remains unseen. So, you know, Xi Jinping is going to face this kind of challenge, whether or not he's going to be tough on Taiwan or he's going to be softer on Taiwan, and how this domestic society is going to react to Xi Jinping's so-called new Taiwan policy. And internationally, of course, you know, this semiconductor challenge imposed by the U.S. sanctions or competition against mainland China remains so formidable. And also, uh, Xi Jinping has proposed quite a few initiatives, sort of like uh, something like, for example, human community with the shared future. However, you know, the more Xi Jinping has proclaimed and the more Xi Jinping has to prove in order to show to the world that mainland China not only say it, but also do it. So people are waiting and see. Definitely, it's going to, we can say there's still a lot of challenges to be overcome. Now, we know that former Prime Minister Li Keqiang, we just heard about his sudden demise. It just happened and sparked global discussion. Having been expected to reform China's economy with Li Keqiang's e uh, economics, how impactful were his 10 years of contribution as the weak Prime Minister under Xi Jinping? Professor Tsai. Uh, yes, uh, Li Keqiang used to be a... Uh, uh, a very, very important figure to, uh, in charge of uh, Chinese economy. Uh, but he was sidelined by General Secretary Xi Jinping because uh, he is a down-to-earth guy. Uh, he's a, a technocrat and free market uh, advocate. Uh, but the thing is that he is from a different faction. We call a uh, Communist Youth League uh, faction. And he's... Uh, mentor is Hu Jintao, the, the predecessor of Xi Jinping. And, but the thing is that he got helicopter permission, uh, permission from uh, Hu Jintao. And, but General Secretary Xi, he's from another faction. It's pr we call Princeling faction. And the thing is that Li Keqiang has some concern about Xi Jinping's policy, especially like uh, state enterprise uh, advance and the private sector's retreat. And also, uh, Li Keqiang has uh, some concern about liberal COVID uh, uh, policy, liberal COVID policy, stuff like that. So it's, it's not like, okay, when you work with a dictator, sometimes you have to be a little bit quiet. You are you can be a doer, not a talker. If you talk too much and you try to say, oh, this is, we have to do things differently. And it's obviously against draconian measures uh, from Xi Jinping. So if he even, uh, uh, Li Keqiang even say, okay, maybe we should do some you know, full stand stuff, all right? And we can ask a lot of people to go out and buy stuff. But it was rejected by the central authority. This is, this is not gonna happen. So that tells you there's a power struggle between him and uh, the highest leader. So this is a, a, a very, very serious question in terms of uh, Chinese uh, style of politics. And Professor Huang, do you think that his death has affected Xi Jinping? I do not think so, because again, Xi Jinping has the full control over the Chinese political system. And Li Keqiang's demise actually left a little bit uh, influence on the general arrangement of Xi Jinping's political schemes and planning. So I would like to say that Li Keqiang, uh, a lot of people say Li Keqiang is not a very impressive pr prime minister, but he's not a bad prime minister as well. So I, I think there's a reporter from the United Daily giving a very good remarks on Li Keqiang. That is, Li Keqiang may be a very successful bureaucrat, but he is a frustrated uh, prime minister. Mm -hmm. 
interesting comment. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi's meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is seen as preparing for the Biden-Xi meeting at November's APEC summit, perhaps symbolizing a thaw in U.S.-China relations. Wang Yi emphasized the need for a restored, deeper and broader China-U.S. dialogue. So is China's outreach due to economic pressure, pushing Beijing to seek a halt in terms of the conflict with the U.S.? What's your take on this? Uh, actually, uh, mainland China cannot live without the U.S., its market and its capital and its mutual help on a lot of important international issues. So I, I personally think that mainland China is now seeking for a very, you know, genuine humiliation of U.S. mainland China relations in order to gain some momentum for its domestic economy and for its uh, domestic control. Uh, not to mention, when Xi Jinping faced uh, a series of sanctions imposed by the U.S. administration, uh, Xi Jinping actually can tell that Xi Jinping cannot fight it back fully. So Xi Jinping has to make some concessions or he has to be very patient with these aggressive, assertive measures undertaken by the U.S. administration, which means Xi Jinping knows uh, in terms of U.S. mainland China competition, mainland China is in an inferior position. So what can the Chinese Communist Party do? You know, according to the history, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is going to be, uh, again, accommodating willing to cooperate when it is in inferior position. So we have no idea what if mainland China's general power, comprehensive power, has been able to increase to a level uh, which it can compete with the U.S. Then now this accommodating or patient policy undertaken by Xi Jinping will remain or not, we'll see. So Professor Huang talked about the inferior position now China is in and also Beijing might be genuine in trying to ease the tension with the United States. What's your take on this, Professor Tsai? Do you think that this is the genuine kind of easing or this is just superficial? I think uh, it's very hard to uh, reach a compromise by just some uh, dialogue or maybe happy talks because it, there are a lot of you know, uh, conflicting interests uh, conflict between uh, China and the United States. Uh, like Professor Wang uh, said, because they got uh, technolog technological war, right? Te tech war, uh, such as uh, advanced chips, artificial chips, that kind of stuff. And China uh, is vulnerable now. So they try to uh, mend a fence with the United States. So that's why uh, Wang Yi went to uh, uh, DC and then he saw the president and also secretary of state. But the thing is that it's very uh, interesting that in, in the United States, they try to use the same formality, protocol, uh, to treat Wang Yi, uh, like, uh, like uh, the Chinese government treat you know, Anthony Blinken in, the, uh, in China. So it, it's very, very, it's like they try to have some uh, diplomatic uh, strategies uh, fighting with each other, right? So it's very easy to talk. But the thing is that you have to uh, get things done uh, because ab after just uh, a couple of rounds of gatherings, it's not going to solve long-term conflicts, that kind of stuff. So my, uh, my view is very pessimistic, but the thing is that maybe they try to have a meeting before the APEC meeting. They try to get prepared for the APEC meeting. That's why Wang Yi went to you know, D.C. So that's my ob observation. Yes. So, Professor Tsai, you talked about the APEC meeting. We will talk about that later. But yes. going back to the meeting between Wang Yi and Blinken, after that, the U.S. and China reopened military dialogue at the Xiangshan Forum. And yes. speculation have arisen, have risen, whether that's related to the dismissal of the former Defense Minister Li Shangfu, who was deemed as a hurdle to U.S.-China military ties. And also, the Beijing's Central Military Commission's leadership have hosted the Forum. What are your views on this um, Shangshan Forum at this time? I, I think it's a, a kickstart because uh, after Pelosi visiting Taiwan, uh, China pulled the plug 
uh, military, uh, we call meal-to-meal -meal dialogue, that kind of stuff. And this year, they try to resume, right, even though it's not the highest level because China uh, doesn't have a uh, defense minister. Still this absent. is very, very, very weird. And that means uh, Xi Jinping doesn't have any trustworthy guy to be the prime minister. But uh, the thing is that maybe there's a power struggle within the party or within the military. We, we don't know that. But the thing is that it's very hard for U.S. to say, who should I talk to? You know, the, you don't have a uh, defense minister. So that's, that's the problem. So, but they still have a very, very uh, conflict dimension because U.S. try to say, uh, because uh, we, we support uh, the idea of freedom of navigation in South uh, China Sea. But China say, no, 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 you cannot fly near our shore because it's our core in interest. And South China Sea is kind of like our internal water, that kind of stuff. So even they have some dialogue, but I don't think they can solve the problems. That, that's my, my view. Professor Huang, what's your take on this? Uh, you know, my hunch is that at least on the working level, the two militaries have begun to engage with each other on some critical security issues. Uh, the reason is that not only the U.S. has sent a senior official to the Shangshan Forum, but also, you know, the background of the U.S. decision to send a high-level official, senior official to the Shangshan Forum is that at least there have been some, you know, working level meetings in order to sort out some possible solutions for this current dilemma between the two big parties. So not on the ministerial or deputy ministerial levels, but on the working level, I think their relationships are thawing uh, in order to face some common problems in international security. Uh, but what about the future? Because Li Shangfu, yes, by uh, by some people, especially in the States, he was the hurdle for the improvement in U.S. mainland China military relations. But in the eyes of a lot of Chinese people, it's the U.S. who posed a section on Li Shangfu, the then defense minister of the PRC, so that you know, mainland China didn't want to communicate with the U.S. on some critical security issues. So you know, you know, we have two sides of the story, but most importantly is that now Li Shangfu has gone. So maybe the upcoming new defense minister of the PRC may not be on the list of sanction of the U.S. So if that's the case, then I think there will be a bigger possibility for the two sides to resume this defense ministerial dialogue. So we know that now the uh, defense minister in China is still absent, but China's highest official attending the forum also said in the opening remarks that some countries deliberately create turbulence and interfere in other countries' internal affairs. We know which countries there he's referring to. But in the meantime, he also said China wants to improve military dialogue with the U.S. So what's your take on this kind of remarks? Uh, it's obvious that mainland China would like to improve military relationships with the U.S. on various levels. But on the other hand, mainland China would like to demonstrate its bottom line in terms of facing a growing, so-called growing U.S. military threat or opposition against the People's Liberation Army. That is why, on the one hand, you can see you know, the P PRC uh, officials said, you know, uh, we would like to have uh, better relations. But on the other hand, you know, anything against the, you know, principles upheld by the People's Republic of China would not be accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but and that also shows that in terms of military relations, you know, there's a hope. There's a hope because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, th the statements made by these top. Uh, party officials has indicated that the PRC is not shutting the door, mm -hmm. neither the U.S. So we, we, we don't have to be that pessimistic because, you know, even if these high-level dialogues hasn't happened, but, you know, all these important international security issues like the Israeli-Hamas conflict 
or the Russian-Ukraine war, you know, all these needs some kind of cooperation between the U.S. and mainland China in order to better manage this ongoing crisis. So you said that by keeping the doors open, there is hope. So my, I would like to direct my uh, question to Professor Tsai. Following the U.S. shooting down the Chinese spy balloon, so U.S.-China relations hit a new low. So can the military tensions really thaw with both nations participating in the Shangshan Forum? I, I don't really think so because uh, it's very hard to solve that kind of problem, especially just a couple of days ago, a Chinese uh, fighter jet intercept U.S. bomber, right? So uh, it's like you, you talk one thing, but you do another, right? Something like that. And also, Zhang Yusha is number two guy in the military, uh, in the military office. And China tried to play a game, like uh, playing a backup and try to, to talk tough, right? So it's like the game of point your finger to someone else. So it is not good for someone who really like to have a good relationship with U.S. now. So they try to do something for the do uh, domestic audience because they don't uh, want to lose face. This is Chinese uh, diplomacy stuff. They don't want to lose face, so they have to talk a big game, right? But in the end, they need the United States. They need, a, uh, they, they need some uh, soft turn, you know, sanctions. Otherwise, it's gonna hurt the whole Chinese economy. They know that, but they still, you know, find someone to say, "Oh, this is our interest," and don't get involved. Uh, so this is, I think, this is very typical. Oh, so someone say, "You shake hands first, and then you wash your hands later." This is very uh, ironic. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor Huang, what's your take? Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's very difficult to imagine that uh, mainland China-U.S. military tensions will continue while these two top-level officials are not going to meet. Meanwhile, I also want to indicate that uh, actually, I, even though we have seen a lot of uh, armed or military tensions in the dispute area like the South China Sea or East China Sea, etc., but, you know, in most cases, I have seen s uh, the both sides exercise self-restraint. And also, we have to know that uh, for both militaries, I mean, the PRC and the U.S., you know, there are some code of conduct on the maritime affairs or in the air. But the, the question is that where, whether or not they will be obeyed they will be abided by, by these two parties. So once the resumption of the talks begins, I think these kind of rules of engagement will be taken back on the table, and gradually the two militaries are going to know, okay, this is the line we cannot cross. You know, so again, I'm more optimistic, but you know, the, the, spe the speed or the development of improvements in cross in U.S. mainland China military relations will takes a lot of time. Definitely, um, it takes time to rebuild trust from both sides. So I would just like to know, what's your take on a possibility of a Biden-Xi meeting at the APEC summit in this November? Do you think that they will really meet? Uh, you know, since neither side say, say no, so I would assume that there is a possibility for Biden and Xi Jinping to meet in APEC in San Francisco this coming November. Uh, also, Wang Yi has visited Washington, D.C. just a few days ago. Uh, he met uh, all these important officials he should have met. So I think, you know, by the rules of thumb in diplomacy, I think there is, they're cooking, cooking this kind Biden Xi meeting in APEC. And also, I always argue that it's very important for Xi to attend the APEC because if she has, she, he has uh, been absent from a couple of important international occasions, if she is not going to San Francisco to attend APEC this time, then people would think, oh, there's a big problem in mainland China's domestic 
affairs. That's why Xi Jinping wouldn't come. So I don't think Xi Jinping would like to bring this image or impression to the rest of the people in the world. So he would try his best to attend. That's my hunch. Okay, okay so uh, I think they will meet up uh, in San Francisco and we'll talk to each other. But the thing is that sometimes they, they just like say something they, what they want to say, okay? So it's somewhat unlikely uh, to reach any compromise, uh, especially this is an economic forum, right? You cannot uh, reach a compromise about military stuff, they can, or maybe guardrails, that kind of stuff. So at any case, uh, engagement uh, cannot satisfy China, uh, China's demands. Because sometimes uh, you talk to each other, uh, and talking is very uh, somewhat easy, but you you cannot talk to talk and walk to walk. Okay, so we cannot expect one-time gathering to solve all the problems. This is not going to happen. This is my my personal view. But definitely, yeah. we expect that with all these resumption of military dialogue and maybe more working level discussions, the meeting will happen. And then moving from there, they can keep trying to say ease the tension and improve U.S.-China relations. Do you? But still, there are a lot of changes we cannot expect or we cannot imagine, you know, from today all the way to the day in November when the two gentlemen are scheduled to meet. Only time will tell. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.